I'm Steph. And I'm Jeff. Each week, we review a film that's streaming online. As writers, we'll deep dive into the characters and plot to tell you if it's a good story. Listen at your own risk. This review contains spoilers. Now sit back. Relax. And and enjoy enjoy Stream On. On. Today, we'll be reviewing Taxi Driver, streaming on Netflix. Travis can't sleep. He drives a taxi through a New York City that seems one step away from complete collapse. When he is spurned by presidential campaign worker Betsy, he starts to lose his tenuous grip on reality. Taxi Driver was directed by Martin Scorsese and written by Paul Schrader. It's a 1976 classic psychological thriller. It stars Robert De Niro as Travis Bickle, the taxi driver, Jodie Foster as Iris, a child prostitute, Sybil Shepard as Betsy, a woman that Travis Bickle becomes obsessed with, Albert Brooks as Tom, a campaign manager, Harvey Keitel as Sport, Iris's pimp, and Peter Boyle as wizard, an older taxi driver. So, Jav, you picked this film. Why? Before I give you what the reasons why, I need to correct a pronunciation. That is Harvey Keitel. With that out of the way, I pick this because it is simply one of my favorite films. It is a classic of 70s cinema which in my opinion is the golden age for American movies. We see Scorsese, De Niro, and Schrader doing some of their best work. It is a wonderful example of how to use your environment as a character, which I'll get into a little bit later. And finally, Travis's character seems as relevant today as he was when the film was made. So I have a question for you about that. Why did you pick the 70s as the golden age of American movies? In the 1970s, you see American cinema loosening up. You're getting past all of the production codes so you could show more adult themes on the screen more explicitly. You had this tranche of directors and producers and actors who had not been part of the Hollywood system. The look of the films is just grittier than earlier eras, especially kind of the technicolor pop of the 50s and 60s. Thematically, I find that the Films of the 70s take a lot more chances than earlier eras. Now, the reason I wouldn't then say, oh, well, what about the 80s and beyond, is that I think a lot of the energy that you saw in American cinema, for those reasons I mentioned, and then also bringing in some sensibilities from like European thin- cinema, that was tamped down. And you started to get into more multiplex fare, safer movies, or even just taking some of the things that were more cutting edge in the 70s, dulling them down, and then making them mainstream. That's, yeah, that's cool. I, I've never thought of the golden age of cinema being a particular decade. I, I think more in terms of every decade has their standout films. So I, that's interesting that, that one decade really spoke to you. Okay, Jeff. So as a writer analyzing this film, what stuck out to you about it? There are a lot of interesting themes and storytelling uh, methods in this movie. I'd like to start out with setting as character. The New York City that... Travis's story takes place in is presented as this vibrant, multi layered living organism that he's kind of worming his way through. We 
get not only this nightmarish opening where Travis's cab emerges from a cloud of steam and like the images he's seeing of the city are distorted by rain and sort of oversaturated. But we also, as the movie progresses, see little bits of other stories taking place in the background. And they're usually all fairly disturbing. There's one scene where this man is walking down the street, screaming to himself about how he's going to find his woman and shoot her. We get some interesting stuff you know, the hookers and the pimps and the johns, all this taking place in the background. But we know from some of the voiceover we get from Travis and just some of the dialogue that he has with other characters, how much all these background stories, all this stuff that we get little glimpses of is corroding his brain. I find that this film presents a master class on how to do that with your setting to make it something real and lived in but also a character in its own right and as a writer you do want to give your settings your places the things that your story takes place in you want to give them a life of their own you don't want to just have a bare description of some place that your characters are doing their plot things in a really good story is going to make that world immersive to the reader or in this case the viewer so what do you think about that did did new york city come alive as a character for you it did i could feel myself in in the streets at night there and in that urban decay right you it it opens so beautifully right um like you talk about the street vapors and that his taxi cab and emerging from that uh you see the pimps and whores and yeah, the rain works because it works with travis's internal thought processes and then his monologue about the filth and how he wants to clean up the city and wash it away like the rain so you get the sense of how what's going on externally is worming its way into the psyche of Travis, who's already not the most stable person. But you wonder if Travis was living out in a, I don't know, the bucolic like, countryside and a little cabin nestled in the valley, would he be as crazy as he becomes in this movie where he is living in you know, what he perceives as the, this urban decay. And so I, I do think this setting very much comes alive to interact with Travis's psyche in a way that helps us understand why he downward spirals. And he, but he chooses, one thing that I want to point out that is related to the setting as character is Travis chooses his routes as a taxi driver. He could have chosen a cleaner, nicer part of New York to do his routes in, he purposely decides to lurk around the more risque, darker, seedier parts of the city to pick up his fares. So there's a part of him, even though he hates it, he's also drawn to it at the same time because that's where he chooses to get his fares from. So I think that's relevant as this the setting of New York comes alive. And one other thing that I'll point out related to that point is that the film does a great job with the musical score, helping the setting, like get you into the ambiance of the setting. Because while you have all this to care around you, you have this really like calming moody relaxing saxophone going as he's driving through the dirty streets uh you can actually listen to a one hour extended version of this on youtube (laughs) i was curious so i pulled it up one night it is it's very relaxing i I would if i got into an uber or lyft and the guy started playing that i'd love it i'd find it funny some people might find it creepy but I'd find it funny if my Uber driver started playing the musical score, but I think it helps you get into like 
the dichotomy of, you know, Travis is like weaving around in his element um, with this like relaxing beauty, uh, music, but then you have the grit and the decay and the ugliness all around him. So yeah, great job with the setting. I agree. You mentioned Travis volunteering, go into the worst parts of mid 70s New York City. It really shows you that Travis's sense of morality and he does have one but it's purely oppositional he wants to be around the horrific elements that he thinks are destroying the world so that he can feel better than them one of his only pastimes is to go to porn theaters but he doesn't look particularly excited by it and there are a couple of scenes where he is like a little kid kind of partially hiding his eyes from the action the scene on the screen it's like that's the only way he can feel that the ideas in his head have value by seeing all these horrible things yeah and that gets at one of the themes that i saw in this film as as a primary theme that i wanted to talk about which is urban anime the, the film looks let me let me define it first so anime it's a societal condition defined by an uprooting or breakdown of any moral values standards or guidance for individuals to follow and it was popularized by a sociologist dark emil durkheim and for durkheim anime arises more generally from like a mismatch between like personal standards and wider societal standards and so we see somewhere a Travis Bickle who has his version of morality, his personal version of morality, uh, thinking that things should be a certain way in society. And then he gets to New York City and he sees much looser moral standards there and an, an absence of law and order at times or, or overlooking things, right? There's a, a burgeoning black market there of sex and drugs and crime and he doesn't know how to fit that into his psyche and so as a result of that he becomes lonelier and lonelier and then he gets stuck in the echo chamber of his mind where he starts forming his own version of morality this us versus them where he's a white knight in his taxi going around to you know save people in the city, like save the damsels in distress uh, and everybody else's filth. And and I think that comes from that sense, you know, if if we believe there's some truth to Durkheim's theory, and, and he is one of the most prominent sociologists, I actually studied him as a social worker. But if we were to believe this concept that that is what happens when you have a mismatch between an individual's morals and society's morals and it can lead to some scary people being created in our society like Travis Bickles. Uh, what are your thoughts on that, Jeff? Well, Travis is clearly looking for something to give him meaning. He repeatedly brings up this idea that he doesn't know where he's going, what his purpose is. We see him early on with Betsy we see him trying to be kind of the stereotypical boyfriend. It was horribly wrong, of course. Cause he goes to Wizard, uh, Peter Boyle, for life advice, which turns out to be a mistake, since Boyle basically has no advice for him. With Iris, he wants to be almost like a comic book hero, go and rescue the the young girl who's being exploited by the evil ogres, her pimps. His fundamental problem, though, is that the way he looks at the world is very dysfunctional. And Durkheim's theory, just to fold that back into the idea of urban anime, is that that disconnect between people that don't feel like they can fit into society because their own internal morals or thoughts don't fit with a larger group leads to them feeling more and more alienated over time. And as a result of that increasing alienation, it disturbs their psyche even more. That 
be, because they don't it, it's it's actually one theory behind why terrorism develops actually they like terrorists they found that a lot of them especially the big ones they what, what causes them to become radicalized is not when they're living in their own country of origin it's when they come to another country with different morals and values than their culture they came from had and they're struggling to fit in and adapt and as a result they end up going to these extremist groups mosques etc and they and then they become radicalized in in America or in Europe or in these other places uh, and you can use the theory of urban anime to explain that but it's like this a similar concept with what's happening with Travis is he just can't he can't match what he thinks internally with what's going on around him in the world. And and he just gets crazier as a result as the movie progresses. And he talks about the idea of like, it's loneliness in a crowd, right? Like that he, he has this good monologue scene where he talks about loneliness has followed me my whole life. And you really get that sense that when, even when he's sitting with a group of his fellow taxi drivers at a diner and they're shooting the breeze. Like you can see how uncomfortable he is. Like he doesn't fit in even with his fellow taxi drivers. He's lonely in a crowd in this big city with no one understanding him. It's a little different than that though. That scene you're talking about where he goes to this all night diner, he has already met wizard and wizard has introduced him to couple other cabbies who are sitting there you're right he's distracted but he is focused on a pair of uh, black guys who are dressed like stereotypical 70s pimps it's not just loneliness it's that even sitting there when you would assume he would either be trying to connect with his fellow cab drivers or maybe just staring off into space he is actually fixated on what he sees himself in opposition to. Hmm. Yeah. Yeah. He, he forms this us versus them mentality to give himself meaning. And this fantasy of himself as the hero cleaning up the streets of New York. He, he sees himself as Batman in a taxi and he's, (laughs) and he's going around and, and he wants to rescue these, these, damsels in distress whether it's betsy the beautiful blonde that's working for palantine who's running for president or if it's iris the 12 year old child prostitute like he wants to rescue these women from the filth and it that's what gives him meaning is this sense that he is going to help clean up the city uh, because he doesn't have a lot of friends and because he's so socially awkward and because he's not fitting into the wider society with looser moral standards than he thinks they should have, he he creates this persona of himself to give him meaning and to fill his loneliness. Travis is presented in a very stripped down way as a character. I mean, even just his character development There are moments when he's uh, specifically talking to Betsy, when he says he doesn't listen to music, is apparently unaware that there are non-pornographic movies, and even how he interacts with people is in a way that is so detached from normal reality or the way people would normally interact. There's a very early seen probably within the first like 10 minutes of the movie where travis goes to a porn theater and decides to hit on the girl at the concession stand which one would assume is probably the last person you want to be hitting on just because of where you are who she deals with and it's initially sad to watch But as the movie goes on, clearly we're supposed to see these things that seem pitiable quickly become unnerving. Right. And there's this really good scene. It's hard to watch, but it's a good scene where I call it the sick passenger scene where he is in, uh, he has a fair and it's actually this passenger is played by Martin Scorsese, which is 
kind of neat, right? And so he, Martin Scorsese, the director, he is talking about how he is going to murder his wife and the guy that basically the wife is having an affair with a black man. And so he talks about how he wants to go and murder them. And he's talking about this whole sick plot in the back of the cab. And Travis is just listening, taking it all in. And it's so well acted by Robert De Niro. You can see it, like his mind starting to churn. Like most people would be really disturbed and like throw the person out of their cab, maybe call the police because this guy's plotting murder. But Travis, you can like, like, it's just so well acted. You can see that it's starting to implant ideas in his head of violence that are probably already there below the surface, but it's like helping solidify them. And I just thought that scene did a great job of showing how Travis is unraveling. Because I, I, I saw that as a turning point in the film where this idea of violence really gets firmly planted in his head that he could actually do this to help right the wrongs of this because he almost agreed with the guy the guy was he was the slighted husband like and you could see that he was agreeing with him internally about like how to right the wrongs and then violence is a way to do that and because Travis was already unstable and he was searching for like place in the world something like this gave him a mission so I I just thought that was well done what did you think about that scene well, the scene is very disturbing and extremely well acted. And while I'm not sure if I would agree that that necessarily is where Travis gets the idea that violence is the answer, it definitely helps to further him down the road to becoming an ideologically free extremist. If this movie was made today... You know, Travis would be some basement dwelling, 4chan surfing, gun fetishizing incel. And all these events in the film, including that scene, are all kind of pieced together to show how someone who is fundamentally unmoored from basic consensus cultural values and norms how that person can become warped to the point where he thinks it's a great idea to go shoot a presidential candidate right because the presidential and and it's hard to know exactly what his motive is for wanting to assassinate palantine You could look at it a few ways. Way number one is that it's misplaced anger at Betsy because Betsy works for Palantine's campaign. She really believes in him, and Betsy rejects Travis pretty early on after that one creepy date where he takes her to the porno. And so you wonder if a lot of it's just misplaced anger, and that's why he's going after Palantine to hurt Betsy. You also wonder if it has to do with Palantine's message because he's very much like we the people and empowering people to come together to create change. And Travis, for the most part, thinks people are immoral scum and can't, shouldn't be trusted to come together to make change. He think he he thinks they can't be trusted. He doesn't want to empower people because they're all immoral scum except him and people that think like him. So it's unclear if it's Betsy, if it's Palantine's message, if it's a combination of both of why he chooses Palantine as his mark. Certainly, either of those is plausible. But I think one of the strengths of this movie is that there is no explanation. You can think it was Betsy, you can think it was what Palantine represented. You could even think it was the brief interaction the two of them have in the cab. It doesn't really matter. Travis has just decided that he needs to do something big. And at that point, the biggest thing in the city is going to be shooting this guy. I think that's one of the most 
disturbing parts of this character is at least with that decision he has made to go and kill Palantine, there is no easy, easy explanation given. Yeah, he's got violence bubbling up in him from urban anime or whatever you whatever reason you want to put towards that. I'll I'll say that's one theory. And he's got to put it somewhere. And it's got to be big. So if it's not Palantine, it's going to be something else, which we'll get to in the ending of this film. I did have another character theme I wanted to bring up to get your thoughts on, Jeff. So the film makes a point to point out that Travis is a veteran. And this gets at a trope we sometimes see in movies about the troubled veteran. So he's a Marine. He was in Vietnam. He's struggling to sleep. He has insomnia. It's one reason he decides to drive a taxi at night because he can't sleep anyway, so he might as well earn some money. He maybe has undiagnosed PTSD from war. I We don't know. Like, the film doesn't really go there, but he has insomnia and he was in Vietnam, so you could maybe make that assumption. I, I guess I'm wondering if making him a veteran works in this film because it doesn't really go anywhere. We don't see fl- him having flashbacks or PTSD type stuff. And he gets more disturbing as the film progresses, but it has nothing to do with him being a veteran. While it's become more of a cliche in film to have the troubled veteran that goes crazy, like as, you know, more films get produced about this, like a Born of the Fourth of July type thing. It's I, I'm sure it was less common back then and it was filmed in a post Vietnam era. But I'm wondering, like, if we're following Chekhov's gun rules where you're going to, if you're going to hang the gun on the wall, you use it later, does making him a veteran matter? And should they have done something more with that in this film? What are your thoughts about it? The writer said that he made him a vet because he wanted Travis to, in part, stand in for the kind of social chaos and dislocation that he saw America going through in the 70s, in that era, when he wrote the story and when this film was made. So he had a very specific reason for doing it, and it was more social commentary. Does it work for the character? Not a lot is done with it. I think you could have cut that character trait out, that little bit of background out, and it would have change the story because it's not particularly important it can be used to explain some of his extreme behavior in the sense that he is undiagnosed ptsd but nothing's really done with that it's not like he's having flashbacks while he's driving his cab it didn't bother me it just seemed more like just a minor bit of character background as opposed to something that was you know of major importance to his development and how he reacts to situations which is a long way of saying i kind of agree with you that it could be removed and it wouldn't change anything yeah and and i might be more sensitive to this because i'm a army veteran myself about veterans being portrayed as unhinged and unstable after they get back from war in film. I just think if you were going to drop that he's a Marine and was in Vietnam, you should have done something more with it in the film that was tangible. Like give him some flashbacks where he's sitting alone in his apartment watching TV and then he flashes back to Vietnam or like have it be more meaningful Uh, Anything else about the plot that stuck out to you, Jeff, to analyze? This movie has an interesting ending. Travis fails in his assassination attempt of Palantine. He doesn't even get to try it. He just runs off being chased by the Secret Service and decides instead that he is going to rescue Iris. 
the sequence where he goes to rescue her is extremely violent. He succeeds in rescuing her, but only by murdering some people. And it ends with him having survived the shootout. Iris is back home with her family, and he gets his nice letters from them saying what a hero he is. He apparently bubbled up into the New York City news cycle as this hero who went and rescued this child prostitute, and he's back in his cab. He randomly picks up Betsy and drives her home, and then there's a moment after she gets out, and he drives off, and the look on his face indicates nothing has changed. He is still the same dangerous, unstable, violent guy. And Paul Schrader addressed this years later. He was being asked if the ending was a dream sequence, that Travis was imagining all this while he laid dying from his gunshot wounds, and Schrader's like, no. But he did say that the way the film is structured is like, you could easily just play it in a loop. That Travis is right back where he started, which I find is a fascinating interpretation, really from the person who wrote it. Yeah, so I did read about that second interpretation that um, it that Travis died in the shootout and then everything, because the camera takes a weird shift, right? After the shootout happens and he's laying there, the camera zooms over the this macabre scene and it it just gives you this like bird's eye view of all of the like murder and destruction which the camera doesn't do anywhere else in the film so it does feel like you're almost like your body is being lifted almost like an out-of-body experience like a fantasy of a dying man being lifted right and then we hear about iris being rescued it just everything seems a little like it worked out too well for Travis that he was seen as a hero. There wasn't any questioning because he killed all these, this riffraff of society that Iris is back home and happy with no issues that everything's just good to go there with her and her parents. And then Betsy randomly gets in his taxi. I mean, New York's a big place. The likelihood of Betsy randomly getting in his taxi is low, I would say. And so, and then he's the white knight, like protecting pretty women from the bad guys on the streets and the ends. Like, so I could see that interpretation working because things just worked out a little too well for Travis. But the, uh, and, and that is an interpretation that's not, it, it, in some ways to me, that's a happier ending if Travis actually dies And this is just the fantasy of a dying man because then we know the crazy is off the street (laughs) for good because he's dead. The less happy ending is the more common interpretation of the film that Travis does survive and he really is seen as a hero because these people are so marginalized and seen as bad people anyway that it's no big deal that Travis killed them Uh, and that... Yeah, he's just this psycho lurking underneath uh, his smile as and calm facade as he picks up people and drives around the city and you're just waiting for him to bubble up again and do something crazy. I mean, that is a much darker, sadder, empty ending than him dying and it being a dream sequence. So I prefer the dying dream sequence ending, but I don't think that's the actual ending. I think the actual one is there's still this psycho driving around in his cab on the streets of New York. As I said, you know, both Schrader and Scorsese have addressed that and said that they did not mean for this to be interpreted as his dying dream. I mean, their big thing is that Travis's psychosis and society's response You know, it's it's a matter of timing and happenstance. If he had shot Palantine, he would have been, you know, a political extremist, a terrorist in a decade that had a lot of them. 
but instead he manages to rescue a young white girl from a bunch of pimps and society says that's great well and it does have relevance today when you think of like the Trayvon Martin case for example and you know the neighborhood watch guy very much similar sees himself as a hero the neighborhood watch guy going around protecting his community and he got away with it right so there are people like that in our society that do things very similar to what Travis has in his head and get away with it what do you think about how relevant this film is today? Well, that's one of the reasons I think this film is interesting and holds relevance today. The last few years in particular, we've seen a lot of people who could easily be Travis Bickles. These are people who don't have much sense of meaning. They are existing in a world that they perceive as changing radically from what they think it should be or from what they believe it used to be. And their response is to focus on marginal elements of society, traditionally oppressed elements of society, the people who don't look or live like them, and they often dress it up in the facade of we're trying to save society we're trying to flush all the animals and scum off the streets because we're trying to save america from all these terrible uh, subgroups and people and influences this character could easily be ported over into a story set today and you'd have to fill around with some of the details like how he is radicalized who he connects up with or if he's a lone wolf how he decides to pick his targets but it definitely fits in with the tone of modern america yeah i think like a group like the oath keepers right that's very present in our news right now these are travis bickles in the making. You can see it in the response of some of these people who have been radicalized when they are caught. And you find that they don't have deep beliefs in anything. We saw this in the aftermath of the violence in Charlottesville, when some of the rank-and-file, neo-Nazi, white supremacist people were called out, it was pretty clear that they were there to attach themselves to a group to give them some sense of being the hero of the story. They don't really believe anything. It goes back to how I said that Travis is ideology-free. His decision to try to assassinate Palantine I don't think has anything to do with Palatine's policies. He just wants to lash out at a public figure that he thinks if he does this, it'll make people see who he is. And I think that you see that a lot today. And to bring this back full circle, that's where Emile Durkheim's theory of urban anime is really relevant today. So, Steph, was there Anything else you would like to talk about as far as the plot? Or would you like to get into what scene you like best? Let's go into our wrap up. So the scene I like the best, there is a scene between Travis and Wizard, who is the older taxi driver. And Travis is asking Wizard for advice on life. And the old taxi driver, Wizard tries to give him advice, but it's it's not very good. Like, he completely misses the mark. So Travis is talking about how he has disturbing thoughts in his head, and he's concerned about his own disturbing thoughts. It's actually one point in the film where you think that maybe Travis has, like, there's a salvageable part there that he recognizes that his thoughts are a little too disturbing and he's seeking help. 
And Wizard's response is he he doesn't get it. He's pretty dense. Like he doesn't get that Travis is as disturbed as he is. But a lot of people don't get how disturbed Travis is. Uh, and he basically says a man takes a job and a job becomes what he is. I'm a taxi driver. That's what I do. I envy your youth. You still have time. Go out and get laid and get drunk. And that's his advice. And Travis is like, this, that's terrible advice. And he's like, well, it's, it's not Bertrand Russell, but what do you want? I'm a cabbie. <laughs> I just thought that was a really good line. So he completely misses how disturbed Travis is below the surface. And he thinks going out and getting drunk and laid will fix it all. And, and we know that won't. But I just thought it was a really well acted scene. And it gets it, again, the sense of urban enemy where people are so caught up in their own worlds and this, like, they're not seeing what lies below the surface uh, in people like Travis. And he, he's totally missing those warning signs. And I, I think that happens a lot that people purposely or just because they're so distracted by their own lives miss the warning signs of the disturbance around them what are your what about you jeff what's your favorite scene first the scene with peter boyle is great and this film has a plethora of amazing scenes i think the best one though is the interaction between travis and iris in a diner. So this takes place near the end of the film. Travis has talked to Iris in this brownstone that's used, you know, like as a brothel. They meet the next day and he's basically explained that he wants to try to help her. At one point she says, well, I'd like to leave and I'm thinking of going to Vermont to join a commune. Why don't you come with me? And he says, no, I'm not going to do that. I like the interaction between De Niro and Jodie Foster. And Foster was 12 years old when she played this role. So it's an amazing acting job. But I like this scene because it does show for all of the kind of horrible elements of Travis, there might be something redeemable deep inside but that he is actually aware that he is too fundamentally damaged to ever allow that out. And that's the whole thing about not going to the commune. She is actually saying, hey, you can rescue me and you can get out of here. And he's like, no, I want to rescue you, but I'm just going to stay here in this cesspool because this is where I belong. And it does get to why Travis has some depth in why he's an interesting character to watch. If he had been a pure psycho, just a killer waiting to explode, I think the movie would be less interesting because he'd be less interesting. But in scenes like this show that for all the damage, there may have been something inside him that was salvageable, but he's too far gone by the time we are watching him. So what was your least like scene? So there's a scene earlier on in the movie in The Hook between Betsy and Tom when they're at the campaign headquarters for Palantine. I call it the matches scene. Mm-hmm. Betsy asked Tom to try lighting a match using three fingers and only one hand. And he isn't able to do it. Like he fumbles around. And then Betsy's like, well, the guy at the newsstand can. And because I guess he only has three fingers in one hand, the guy at the newsstand. And Tom's like, oh, well, maybe he's part of the mob because the mob cuts off fingers and kills people. And there's just this back and forth about that. And I'm just unsure why this scene exists. It was just felt a little tonally off in this film. And I know it was used to create some bonding moments between Betsy and Tom. But Tom's such a minor character. I just felt it took up unnecessary screen time and it felt it was just a weird scene to me. I believe it was in there so that we could see in part why Betsy would be open to going out with Travis. 
Tom is the kind of guy that you would expect Betsy to hook up with. Successful, witty, clearly, you know, they both have the same interests since they're both working on this campaign. But there's that kind of superficiality and glibness about him. So that when Travis shows up, I believe it is right after that scene, and successfully asks her out for coffee, it's his directness that attracts her to him. The scene itself is fine, but I think that's the point of it, because all the interactions between Betsy and Tom are sort of like that. Yeah. Yeah, I didn't 100% understand why she accepted the date other than curiosity and entertainment value of going on the date with Travis because he did seem an odd match for her. But maybe, maybe that's what the matches scene uh, was intending to do. There is a scene where she says Travis is unlike any other guy she's known. And... I'm not sure if she uses the term that he's, you know, more direct. But I think you are supposed to get it that because he is a little more, not awkward, but doesn't really have a good sense of social cues, that she actually finds that a kind of refreshing bareness, if you will, that she doesn't get around guys like Tom. Yeah, and then she sees the error of her ways pretty quickly after the first date, that there's his social awkwardness is taken to another level when he takes her on that date to the porn theater. Well, right. She finds out that it's not that he's just socially awkward, it's that he is missing the kind of social and cultural cues that are touchstones, commonality, that allow people to connect. She mentions Chris Christofferson being like her favorite musician. And Travis claims not to know who that is. Chris Christofferson was very well known in the 70s. The idea that this guy wouldn't know who that is, I think that's one of those indicators of how detached he is from just normal life. So what is your least favorite scene? The Palantine in the taxi scene. Palantine and a couple of his aides pile into the back of Travis's cab. They're talking. Um, Travis kind of interjects, but it's really surface. Just like, hey, I'm going to vote for you. You're great. And then Palantine makes a mistake of asking Travis's opinion. And Travis starts ranting and there's a there is a fun end to that scene where you see the guys in the back seat as travis gets more extreme look kind of horrified and palantine is kind of able to massage what travis is saying into kind of bland politics the problem is it's completely pointless there is absolutely no reason for travis to interact with palantine in fact, I think it would have worked even better if Palantine was always a distant target for him, a more of a symbol as opposed to a person. And the randomness is a bit much. Yeah, I agree with the randomness. It's just like Betsy getting into his cab later on. It's unlikely in a city that big. Okay, so what is your final panda rating, Jeff? I gave this one five out of five taxi driving pandas. The acting is wonderful. Cinematography is beautiful. New York pops as this metropolis on the edge of complete collapse. Travis is an interesting character. There's just nothing about the movie that is really wrong. How about you? It's your first five. That's exciting. I gave this film a four out of five pandas. This is a solid film. It's a good exploration of urban alienation and existential angst. Amazing musical score. Like I said, I could light a candle and sip a cup of tea and listen to this saxophone for over an hour, which you can do on YouTube and just keep it in a loop. 
It had solid acting, particularly by De Niro and Jodie Foster. Some good scenes uh, in interplay between these characters. And I love the scenes of just Travis driving around in his taxi at night uh, because you can feel that city come alive. It loses a point for me because I felt there was some redundancy. There was multiple scenes of him sitting alone watching TV that I felt went on a little too long or even rehearsing like his violence. Like there was multiple scenes of that. I mean, there's the famous one, Are You Talking to Me?, which is great. And I know that was an improvised scene by De Niro and that's like the big scene in this film. So that's fine, but I didn't need multiple scenes like that. And, um, yeah, I would say those are the main reason it lost a point for me. Also, the matches scene I didn't like. But other than that, I mean, this is a a great film. It's a classic. It's worth a watch and extremely relevant today still. So highly recommend checking this one out. Thank you for joining us for Stream On. Tune in next week when we'll be reviewing Radium Girls, currently on Netflix. Stream On is a production of Steph and Jeff Wright's Media. Reproduction without written consent is prohibited. All rights reserved 2021.